And looking at complications of cardiac surgery was kind of cool. The other day I was flying down, and this article by Linda Chu, who was one of our junior faculty, was published talking about um, many of the different complications uh, post-op and making the point about proper technique and an understanding of what needs to be done, and making the point also about 5% of patients um, more high morbidity, high mortality surgery, even in the best of uh, institutions. An important part of what we do really is being able to detect many of the complications in the post-op period, with the complications varying between early and late-term late complications. I won't discuss protocols, but again, typically when you're looking at the aorta, the root, we do try to gate everybody, minimize the dose, but uh, gating is indeed critical. It's important to get thin sections, as from the prior speakers, the importance of reconstructions, whether it's a multiplanar or 3D, is really critical. And things, for example, like pseudoaneurysms, volume visualization tends to work very nicely. So let me show you a series of cases, and uh, I'll let you think about the answers. This is a patient who had a TAVR several weeks earlier, and now is presenting back to her physician with some increasing chest pain, some very funny symptoms, some increased shortness of breath, and uh, that's the non contrast scans, obviously. And then here is the arterial imaging. Okay, and uh, I'll show you a couple reconstructions. There's a a oblique view looking at the root, and then here is a couple 3D images looking at there and looking there. Okay, so everyone has their answer, and if you go back looking at the images, I'll go backwards, you can see the non contrast scan, this outpouching posteriorly at about 6 o'clock, which nicely opacifies, and you can see as you go through the sequence of images, you're able to basically isolate the process, and on the 3D map it shows indeed very nicely, uh, and as many of the cases I've seen today and you've seen today, this was a pseudoaneurysm. They're a little bit unique in one of the TAVR patients. I don't think we've seen too many of these. I guess it probably is not a surprise. Very difficult patients, older patients with poor uh, aortic valves and poor vascular structures, the development of pseudoaneurysms should not be uncommon. In thinking about surgical complications of the aortic root, probably one good way of thinking about them, if you had to divide things into three, would be complications within the root, complications outside the root, and benign postoperative complications. And that's a very good way of looking at them, and there was an article by Prescott uh, this year as well talking about these postoperative complications, and often uh, looking at the ones that need further intervention, from pseudoaneurysms to stenosis to dissections and the like. If you try to divide things up, you really have about five major complications if you put things within the aortic root from pseudoaneurysms on down. There have been a number of cases shown yesterday and even in this session about pseudoaneurysms, and although they occur in less than 0.5% of cases after cardiac surgery, they seem to occur more commonly in conferences. Um, mediastinitis, mediastinitis and graft infection are probably the most common risk factors though they are more frequently seen in patients who have uh, diseases like Marfan's and Takayashi's, and particularly in Marfan's, we do see lots of pseudoaneurysms, which is probably not a great surprise. Um, also, depending how the surgery is done, certain techniques will really uh, lend themselves to developing more pseudoaneurysms. Pseudoaneurysms can occur basically in five different sites, with the most common site really being at the graft and astomosis site. Um, and then the second most common would be the coronary artery anastomosis. In terms of presentation, sometimes there'll be an incidental finding on a routine follow-up study, and maybe that's probably, in our experience, the most common uh, presentation. But others, like in this case, ranging from chest pain to heart failure to sepsis, are all indeed possibilities. And just to look at a few different examples, here's a nice case showing you a pseudoaneurysm at the graft anastomosis site very nicely seen from the axial into the 3D. Here's a nice example of a pseudoaneurysm at the coronary artery anastomosis site. Uh, these are usually smaller. Uh, again, the propensity to rupture may be a bit higher in these. And here's a nice example of a pseudoaneurysm at a previous cannulation site. So again, uh, looking at the aneurysm, looking at the site, really you can put things together, and often the 3D mapping will help you understand that process.
In terms of delivering information to the surgeon, to the thoracic surgeon, I think the mapping becomes very critical. Surgery still ends up being the treatment of choice. Uh, again, these are difficult patients, and surgery um, at times is put off, but it invariably needs to get done. High morbidity and high mortality in these patients, which is probably no great surprise. Uh, people have looked at endovascular treatment of pseudoaneurysms. There's a few successful case reports in the literature, but it's uh, typically not the standard of care. Okay? Next case. Now, this is a Marfan's patient who had a prior valve sparing and aortic root replacement, and now is coming back for his routine follow-up a year later. In Hopkins, we do a lot of Marfan's patients. Remember that the uh, surgery for Marfan's, the composite graft, was... Uh, invented or discovered or initiated by Vince Scott, who was the head of cardiac surgery at Hopkins for about 35 years, and uh, Duke Cameron, who's the head of cardiovascular surgery now, is the person who has the most experience, I think, worldwide in replacing these. But looking at these images, you can see the little marks I put at the arrow, and hopefully you come up with an answer. And uh, those are the um, aneurysms just where the reimplanted coronaries are. And uh, I heard Stefan uh, ask a question before, when do you worry about these? And it's something, uh, it's not quite clear as was commented on. Uh, um, everyone uh, in the beginning, I think Dr. Cameron would operate more frequently on these patients. Now there's a great tendency to watch these patients. Uh, very, very important. Uh, again, Marfan syndrome, Lowy's Dietz are gonna be the most common and conservative management tends to be what happens. Uh, these root, these uh, reimplantations and aneurysms, again, here's another Marfan's patient. Most of them we see are probably in the seven millimeter, eight millimeter size range. When they start getting over 11 or 12 millimeters, I think then everybody tends to be more concerned, but there's still uh, no consensus on operating to these patients, particularly invariably these patients are asymptomatic. Okay, you can see a nice example there on the MIP and volume rendering. Okay, another case. Uh, this is a patient, it's a great case. Uh, this is a patient who's 51 years old who has a history of Marfan's and has had three prior surgeries for root repair and presents with a chest wall mass. And you can see a series of non-contrast and contrast images. And um, what do you think? Now, I will tell you, so what they ended up doing in this case, so it was not operating, they decided to tap her chest wall mass. They got some blood, they drained the blood she did fine. Um, came back about three months later. Here we go again. Now you can see the chest wall mass is much smaller. Uh, Non-contrast, look at the imaging of her uh, root and coronary, her left main. And here is a couple more images right there. So you can see actually very nicely the uh, active bleed from the patient's left main coronary artery, nicely shown in the 3D maps there as well. So what happened in this patient basically was uh, she bled and it dissected through her chest wall. And we've seen a few patients now who have had you know, bleeds extending, you could say, into the mediastinum is not uncommon. But into the chest wall, this is a, basically a patient whose only symptoms were this enlarging chest wall mass. And in fact, the initial presentation was to send her for a mammogram. Okay, but just a very, very nice example there. This is an article, uh, there's a case report written about this uh, by one of our, uh, he was a med student at that time, he was a fellow this past year, talking about coronary artery anastomosis or uh, bleeds in patients with Marfan's. It's fairly unusual, but there are a number of different reported cases. And again, something, um, again, focusing on these Marfan's patients, uh, there can be significant complications. Another case, talking about post-op, uh, this is a patient who developed chest pain, dyspnea, and sepsis about a little less than a week post-op. And not a very tricky case, but I put this in to be complete, talking about metastinitis. And at least to make the point that I think early on it's very, very hard to uh, uh, determine what patients do with metastinitis just based on the imaging. The difference between a post-op scan at three to five days and infection can be exceedingly difficult. The presence of air is not uncommon. Uh, in a post-op patient, even for up to, say, 10 days. There have been a number of different articles looking at some of the things. Metastinitis uh, incidence is a bit under, uh, typically under 
Patients who do have it have a much higher mortality rate, obviously. Presentation, fever, chest pain, sepsis. Sepsis tends to drive you to thinking about the correct diagnosis, but it is fairly difficult. There's an article published a couple years back talking about this. Uh, staph is the most common uh, microorganism in postoperative acute metastinitis. And in this article, they felt that if you saw air bubbles past 14 days, uh, then it was high sensitivity and specificity. And it's hard to argue about that, but I think the problem probably is that five to uh, 13 days where it's really, uh, you can, it's a te great tendency to potentially overcall. And the question is, what do you do in that scenario? I think if the air seems to be increasing, then it's kind of simple, but a few tiny air bubbles, bubbles do make it indeed a challenge. When you look at acute metastinitis, as you're all aware, increased attenuation of the fat, air bubbles, increasing fluid typically are all common things. The association with pleural effusions and empyema is fairly common. Okay, another case, uh, very, very similar uh, area thinking about this is a 59 year old post root replacement presents with chest pain and uh, chest wall swelling. And you can see very nicely here this large soft tissue mass, high density, kind of looks in part blood. But you can see, as we typically look in post-op patients, looking at the sternum for any complications, including osteomyelitis. In this case, there's dehiscence, classic example of sternal dehiscence. Um, often, uh, the suggestion is made by plain films, but it can be very difficult. You look at things, for example, like the uh, sternal wires, whether any of the wires are rotated or fractured, for example, whether it is widening of the metastinal stripe. Sternal dehiscence is not that uncommon, about 7% of patients or up to 7% of patients. It's more common in some of the more difficult patients. Obesity, patients on steroids, patients with chronic renal disease or reoperations are all predisposing factors for patients not having great outcomes. And you can see a few nice examples. Uh, we've seen several cases like this where one of the sternal wires is pushing upward and causing local inflammation, inflammation and breakdown and often abscess formation. You can see in this case, uh, one of the nice things about post-processing the data is the ability to look at the orientation of the wires and both portions of the patient's sternum. And here it is just showing it to you with a little bit of color coding showing you the mapping. Or in the second example where you can see the lower portion of the sternum, uh, that the sternal band is basically separated from the left, le left half of the sternum. It's now displaced, and you can see it in a number of different projections. I think one of the challenges, at least to me, is looking at these post-op cases. Dehiscence is kind of easy, you know, malplacement or a fracturing of wires or plates is easy to recognize. I think more of a challenge probably is when do you call things osteomyelitis. You do get a periosteal reaction. There's some changes you typically would get in terms of healing. Um, I think when you start seeing significant resorption of bone, you really got to be focusing uh, more on osteomyelitis. We talk about the third category would have been benign postoperative changes and some of the unusual appearances with elephant trunk procedures and some of the unusual surgeries people are now doing that tends to at times simulate the sections when you look at the axial images are all very important to be able to recognize. We also talk about the pitfall of hyperdense surgical material. If you're uncertain, like a case like this, if you only look at these images, you might say, could this be a leak? If you had the non-contrast, you would recognize it's just the typical pledges from surgery. If you're uncertain on the images and you only did a contrast enhanced scan and you don't have any old scans, the easiest thing to do is just simply go back, get some delayed scans at three minutes or four minutes, and then the answer is uh, fairly simple. But I've seen a number of cases where there's an overcall of patients having extravasation or even pseudoaneurysm. So again, if you don't have the non-contrast, which tends to solve the problem, delayed scans are the easiest thing to get. Um, an article by Prescott, again, making the point that uh, it can really simulate pathologic processes. And the last thing you want to see is someone going back to the OR for a complication that indeed does not exist. Other things, um, you've seen some of the cases in this session as well, talking about uh, the aortic valve and complications of aortic valve surgery. Um, one of the things CT does a fairly good job is really looking at the valve and looking at many of the complications, particularly if you have a wider spacing of the images so that you can do 4D reconstructions, which indeed can be very helpful. 
There's issues potentially with beam hardening artifacts or prostheses, though that does not tend to be typically an issue. You can do some iterative reconstruction, which can reduce the artifact in select cases as necessary. When you start looking at valvular complications, you can divide things into long-term or short-term complications, prior interventions, or potentially related to patients' treatment, including medications. Here's a nice example. This is a patient who developed increasing dyspnea, came back, had an echo. They weren't quite sure what was going on. But just take a look at this series of images, and I'll show you about three sets of images. Here's one set, and again, look at this lower density right here, which is very important. And here's a few of the other images. And here's a sagittal view. And what I'll then do is I'll show you the same images. Again, look at this leaflet here and the little low density around it. And here it is if you start looking at the 4D display. And what's, what you usually can see very nicely on CT is the classic motion of the, uh, the valve leaflets uh, functioning nicely. And in this case, you can see the relative lack of motion. And you can see that again. Here's another set of images. Look at the patient's leaflets. We kind of just simply isolated them. And you can see normally you get the nice opening and closing, which you're not getting in that example. And here's just one more, one more picture of that. And again, very nicely showing you the, uh, that failure of basically the valve to open. And so this was a failed aortic valve with thrombus on the valve. I think the low density part, again, a couple examples before of uh, patients who have vegetations on valves, be it native valves or AVRs, for example. It's a very, very classic appearance. I think with fast scanning or gated scans, it's very easy to recognize, but a nice example of a fade, failed valve. Simple case, patient several days post-op, uh, chest pain, fever, Again, the thought was metastinitis. In this case, you can see uh, the large collection in the pericardium for the most part, also in the metastinum, classically high density, a uh, good example of pericardial hemorrhage. And again, uh, not uncommon. Uh, this is often a later complication, though it can occur in the post-op period. Uh, this patient was a bit post-op, and um, patients on Coumadin, for example, it's one of the potential issues. We talk about the pericardium, we talk about fluid, and we talk about some of the challenges. And CT is very good at looking at the pericardium, both in the uh, patient with the native pericardium and those who have had surgery. Uh, things like cardiac tamponade, which that patient was in fact developing. The things you want to look at as discussed from large pericardial effusions to enlargement of the SVC or IVC, periportal edema or reflux of contrast all become very critical. Let me show you another case, which sort of is a uh, post-op case. This is a patient, looks like we gave oral contrast. So here's the images. The patient comes in with chest pain from prison. That's the images. Now I'll tell you, he was in an altercation several years earlier and had chest surgery, had cardiac surgery at that time, was put back in prison, comes back now with chest pain, was felt to be a malingerer. See those images? Probably was a malingerer, but nevertheless, malingerers have pathology as well. Look at that sagittal view. Uh, this patient developed a uh, pseudoaneurysm recurring near the site of prior repair. So just a very nice example. His first scan two or three years earlier looked almost identical. So concluding that, I think CT is critical, managing post-operative patient. Again, understanding what has been done in patients from the procedures. Uh, many of the different procedures have very specific complications. Again, uh, CT in the acute setting, gating, uh, good delivery of contrast uh, really makes life fairly easy. And again, post-processing becomes very, very important. And with that, I thank you for your attention.